Welcome, everyone, to our podcast, Smart Man, Smarter Woman, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And thank you for giving us a listen today. I am Steve Lotz. And I am Juliet Aurora. And we are your co hosts. And before we introduce today's special guest, why don't we hear a few words from my wonderful co host, that smarter woman herself? Juliet. How are you doing today, Juliet? You look fantastic, by the way. That light coming in from the window is just unbelievable. Yeah, so our audience is probably not picking up on the sarcasm there from Steve, and probably a good thing it's a podcast and not necessarily, you know, like a video on YouTube, because the light is quite bright and is kind of washing out all my color. But hey, I am excellent. It's sunny out. Even though it's cold, it's sunny, so I can't complain at all. It's a great day. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Juliet. And so without further ado, let's bring in our, our special guest. Now, when we were chatting before the show, I did pick up a slight accent there, and I didn't ask him where he was calling us from. So maybe he could uh, tell us uh, that when uh, he introduces himself. So welcome very much, Vernon Brown. And thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. You guys are legit. Thank you for having me here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Our pleasure. And so where is that accent, Vernon? That is too funny because I hear people say that often. I'm I, I don't know. I never realized I had an accent. I always ask people, what does it sound like? My mom's Native American and my dad's African American. I don't know what kind of accent <laughs> can be derived from that, you know? <laughs> Richmond, Virginia, maybe it might be a little taste of a draw, but I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go with that. Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Well, before we get into it, if you could uh, maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and who you help. That would be great. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So my name is Vernon Brown. I'm the founder of What You're Happy. I'm a happiness and success coach and professional speaker. Been so going into my seventh year now, and it's about getting people to the next level, however they define it, using happiness. That's the big thing. And when I say happiness, I'm not saying smiles and medication. I mean, happiness as an energy. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that entrepreneurs, we wear ourselves out going after so many different things, right? And rightfully so, we wear many different hats. We have to, you know, learn so many different foundations to continue to excel, but it wears us out. And so for myself, I, you know, I work with entrepreneurs, business owners on advancing their professional themselves as well as managing their personal. You know, as you continue to be more successful, you start bringing in, you know, or, you know, other things, however you measure success with it, you know, obviously it's financial, but you want to make sure that you have the right relationships in life. You want to make sure you have proper boundaries in life. You know, the thing about being successful is your phone rings a little bit too much because people want to say, oh, hey, how you doing? You got five dollars? Like, we need to talk about putting some boundaries out there. But it's about, you know, um, you know, you know, overall growth of the entire person and, you know, and everything that they're working on. But That's yeah, awesome. I love that. I really do. I think that we come across a lot of entrepreneurs. And Mm -hmm. the one resounding thing that we hear over and over and over again, and it really doesn't seem to matter where in their journey they are. You hear it more often when they're starting out and building their business or in the middle of their business, but not necessarily, you know, as they're trying to wind down. But it really is about being overwhelmed, balancing everything, feeling like, you know, something's going to give. And I think that what everyone has experienced over the last eight months, it's been tough on small business Mm -hmm. Um, and small business is entrepreneurs. And it's been even more so that they've had this extra layer of pressure put on them. So I'm, I'm hoping and confident that, you know, there's the discussion today is going to help a lot of people in our audience today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm very um, confident that it will, because there's a lot of things that we all share collectively and sure we talk about things, you know, with some level of transparency, but I think the step that gets missed is, you know, what are some actionable things that we can do regular, regularly that really seem minuscule in concept, but they show up big and exec- big and like, you know, the result, right? Yeah. And so those are those kind of the, the basic tenets that I really like to focus on. And so I, I start everybody off at. Excellent. Excellent. And, and for a lot of people, they think that they have to do lots of big things mm-hmm. in order for something to, to show up in their life. 
And so I think it's going to be really good for them to hear that it doesn't have to be big things. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I am I'm curious, what made you start down on this path? Like what led you to becoming a coach, you know, and, and why a life success coach? You know, it's funny. I mean, you'll find out why I'm laughing in a minute. It's, it, I never wanted to do this. Never, ever, ever in my life. I can literally say I stubbed my big toe and I said, I can't believe I'm doing this. I was, it was an accident. But, you know, I, and I embrace it. You know, when I, I left a previous career because, you know, I was an actor and model in New York and, you know, traveled across the country. And I'm not trying to sit there to impress. I'm just trying to impress upon you. Like, I stopped doing that because I don't like to be the center of attention. I don't want the focus. I'm the guy who likes to be behind the camera. I'm a nerd. I don't know if you can see it, but there's Spider-Man memorabilia here. I'm a nerd. I'm the guy who just, I don't know, that's just me. My son's named after Wolverine. His name is Logan, right? It's just like, I'm nerd 3.0, you know? But what happened was, you know, after I got done with that career, I came back, you know, to Richmond and I said, like, what do I want to do? And I want to do something that was in more control. Like, it's great to travel and meet some really cool people. I had some really great experiences that I don't take any of those back. But I want to do something that made more sense in terms of impact, in terms of, you know, confidence, right? You know, there's a lot of things that you can, that, that, again, I experienced there, but you turn a magazine page and it's over. You stop watching that commercial and I'm gone. Like I wanted like a legacy. That's the thing I wanted. I thought it was pretty ambitious of me at the time, but I didn't know what that looked like. And I got with a mentor, you know, and I talked to him and I said, what do I, what do I do? What would I, and, and been a good mentor, what do you want to do? You know? And he knew about a lot of the struggles that I had in my past, you know, um, just, you know, poor, you know, the, the stupid, ugly, fat one, being evicted, just someone trying to kidnap me. He knew about the gory, bloody details that I had to go through to become who I am, which we all have, right? We had to experience some sort of struggle that promoted us to grow. And he said that you should really consider life coaching. Yeah. And this is why I was laughing earlier. I'm like, I can't stand that term life coach. Don't call me life coach. And, he, and I told him, I was like, I'm not doing that. I don't even like the name. And him being a good mentor, he knew I didn't know what it was. And he said, Vernon, you need to do this. And I said, no, I'm not. And him being a tough curmudgeon man that I love to death, kept pushing. And I said, fine, I relented. And I went and looked into it. And I said, all right, you might have some smarts about you, old man. That's what I was thinking. And that's our joke. It's old bull, young bull story I always talk about with him. And I looked into it. I mean, I came back to him with, you know, something that was bothering me. And I said, look, I'm not old enough to do this. I'm 30. And he looked at me and said, Vernon, you live many lives already. And when he said that, I'm like, God bless America, he's got me, you know? And, and I, I decided well, if I wanted to do this, I want to do something that's different. I wanted to do something that would not just be catchy, but something that I noticed that was a theme that always showed up when I was around. It wasn't that it was me necessarily, but I just the way I would see the world, the way that people always felt more energetic and energized. And I said, happiness coaching. And once, you know, I kind of understood and kind of implement how I wanted to show up, um, what you're happy just came to be, and it was seven years ago. And I thought it was pretty ballsy anyway, because who would start a business about happiness? Like, what is wrong with you? Everyone thought it was stupid. <laughs> Who's laughing now, you know? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I personally, I think it's, it's a great idea. I mean, thank you. everybody, you know, wants to be happy, right? I mean, it's, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who said, I don't want to be happy. Right. So uh, there's certainly, I think, a huge need out there. And, and I guess the, the, the interesting thing is, is that everybody's happy place or everybody's happy is different. Yes. Right? I mean, what is your happy place may not be mine, may not be Juliet's. So we all want this thing, whatever it is, but it's not necessarily the same for any two people. And so that must also be very challenging. What do you find in the people that you work with? What are some of the biggest challenges or, or more, more common challenges they have in trying to find their happy place? This is a great question. I want to say what you mentioned about happiness is the truth. And that's why my practice is what's your happy. Not your mom's, not your dad's, not your aunt's, not your... Neighbors, it's your happy, your subjective brand of happiness. My happy is not the same as your happy, I can promise you. I love going to grocery stores and looking around the aisles. I'm not buying one thing on the shelf, but that's my happy. I love doing it. That's why I love whenever I travel. I'm like, oh, 
I need a hotel or a grocery store. But you know, I, I think the number one, in fact, I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt thing that I see that um, when people are trying to find a happy is low energy. Low energy is the number one thing out there. And just to describe it, it's lack of concentration, focus, awareness. You can become critical, you become judgmental. It makes it harder for you to learn things quite as efficiently. Uh, a big thing is the isolation that can start to happen. Uh, you, you just don't hit on the mark as often as you would like. And you, you stop becoming curious. You become a bit rigid in your thinking and approach. And oftentimes when I see someone low energy, and I want to make sure I say this, like everybody with a heartbeat, anything with a heartbeat is prone to low energy. It can happen in life. Remember, your brain is not designed to keep you happy. It's designed to keep you alive. You're in charge of that. And it's whenever I see someone and work with somebody, and it's not all the time, but often enough, I'll see it. And, I'm just like, and I, I can just tell, they, we got to get you curious again. And when you're trying to find that happy, the curiosity is the first step. We got to get you curious about what you used to do. We got to get you, you know, curious about what other people are doing for you happy. Because sometimes things, the things that used to make you happy five years ago, 10 years ago, don't make you happy now. And that's okay. But you need to get curious about some other things you can go towards. I do want to say that, you know, all right, you find out what makes you happy. Your life is going to change. No, but you're going to have more energy to invest in the things that you really want versus what you are accepting. And oftentimes we take what's given to us, but going after what we want. And so when you have more energy, um, cause you're doing your happy, guess what happens? All of a sudden things start making sense. The business starts making more money. You're trying to figure out how you can finally think most people are in a reactive state. They're not thinking, hmm. you know, you go up to someone and they say, well, I don't know what's going on in my business. And I just ask them what would they like to have happen? They get quiet. Like, Oh, maybe you, you got to make people think. The power is in the questions. I never tell you what to do. I just ask you the questions to get you to think. Interesting. So, so I love that statement that you, I guess, shifting your, your state of being gives you more energy to actually do all the things that you really want to do. And I don't think that a lot of people would even put the two of those together mm-hmm. that they would think, well, I need to do more stuff. It has nothing to do with anything else. I just need to do more stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think that's an important distinction. You know, it, 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 you bring up such a great point. You know, one of the things that, you know, I forgot to mention and forgive me for that is when energy is low, we tend to use our chief function against us. And you know what smart, capable people do. We tend to do more of the stuff that's not getting us any closer. I need to work harder. I need to work harder. I need to work harder. And what happens, you're working harder, but you're not getting any results. So now you're frustrated. You're working harder. You're sleeping less. Some of your relationships might be, you know, I don't want to say, you know, not to over-dramatize, suffering a little bit. You're getting more frustrated. And now it's taking you even longer to produce a result less than what you want. And so one of the big things of doing less is like, what would it, if, if you could only do three steps, what would you do here? Most of the time we make it more complicated than what we need it to be. And I let people know that keep it simple, stupid. You don't need to make it complicated. So what would be somebody's starting point if, you know, some of the things that you've said resonate with them and they're listening to this and they're going, okay, yeah, that's me. What, where would you get them? Where would you start them? The first thing I would ask them and ask everyone, this is what have you been doing for fun? You know, cause I'll have someone come in, you know, come in virtually, right? And I'll come in and they'll just start describing some of the things that's going on. And this is not always a starting place. I want to make sure I say this, but most times, especially now during everything that's going on, it is because we're all living lives a little bit more, a bit more constructs than what we would like. And I always ask people, what have you been doing for fun? And they might say, well, might say nothing. They might say something or get ready to say something. And I'll say, hey, I need to qualify this. It can involve buying or spending. It can involve food or alcohol. And it only can involve yourself. And then they look at me and they're like, well, what's left? And I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's what you got to figure out, you know? And, you know, and, and I don't ask that question ever to shame or demean, but it's to let people know fun is the first thing that goes. It's the very first thing to go whenever we start working on something in life that we're excited about, right? Rightfully so. But fun is the first thing that goes and it needs to be the first thing that stays. You know, I work with an executive and, you know, the way I'm thinking of, she's having just these troubles in a relationship or in a marriage. And the relationships that she's having with some of her employees. And I just sat back and I'm listening to her and I said, what have you been doing for fun? And she was furious. She got mad at me. And she was five, four. And this is when we were meeting people in public. And I'm just sitting there and I'm six, four. And I'm just like watching her. And I was like, what have you been doing for fun? And she like rolled her eyes and she was like, I can't believe you. You're asking me this question about what have I been doing for fun? I came here and da, da, da. And I just looked at her and I said, so? 
And she got so mad at me. I remember that. I tell her story um, to a few times I go on stage and she said, I haven't been doing anything for fun. And what happened? She's working 50, 60 hour weeks. You're not working efficiently. You're not. I can promise you, you're not. If we started off with this lady, we started off, she got 30 minutes to herself. You got three kids, you got a husband and you're an executive. How much time are you really giving to yourself? You know, it's, you know, I gotta be, you know, I don't know, this may be a cringeworthy statement for um, some people who are hearing this, but women are notorious for not taking time for themselves because they're taking care of children, right? And I say that because, you know, I'm, I'm home with dad, I'm a stay-at-home dad, so it's like, I get it, I get it. But we started off with 30 minutes, and for someone um, just coming in, it's like, we need to make sure we build some time in. Why is that important? It gives you time to think. It gives this thing time to stop thinking about what's wrong. You know, there's so much negative around us. Remember, negativity sticks to you like Velcro. The positive flows off like water. It's like oil and water. It just goes. And you got to work hard at keeping that. I'm not telling you to clap your hands and stomp your feet and your life is going to get easier. But I'm telling you this, when I can get you to a place when I can get you to think, and especially with the questions I ask, I don't ask questions that are leading. I'm not, again, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I might warn you of cautions. But then I would just start asking you some questions about what's really going on. You know, walk me through what the day-to-day life looks like. And then I start optimizing the schedule. That's a big thing that I'm always doing. It's like, we've told ourselves, I have to do this. Why do you need to check your email 25 times in a day, in an hour? Why? Tell me what you're looking for. But then you'll, um, and I'm not picking, I get it. Because especially at the beginning, when you first start out, you just want to be successful. Or even wherever you are in your journey, you want to be successful. Or there's just a lot of things that even I was doing that, you know, were taking my energy. I don't need to do laundry every single day, you know? But you find out that if you really sit down, and this isn't everybody, but oftentimes is we just are busy for the sake of being busy. We will continue with our conversation right after this message from a friend of the show. AIS Solutions is an award-winning cloud accounting firm serving small businesses all across Canada. If you want to move your bookkeeping from the desktops of the dark ages to the cloud and get your financials wherever you are, whenever you want them, then contact AIS Solutions team of trained professionals today at www.aissolutions.ca. And now, back to our conversation. That's very, very true. You know, it, it's one that one of, I think, the most difficult lessons, not only for entrepreneurs to learn, but I think a lot of adults uh, who aren't even entrepreneurs. I think, obviously, we talk to entrepreneurs and the, the audience for our podcast is entrepreneurs, and they're very susceptible to it because when you start your own business, as you said early on, you're wearing many different hats. Mm-hmm. You're trying to do everything. You want it to succeed, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, why is it such a challenge, right, for us to try to sit back and think? I mean, I think of reading. Yeah, I love reading biographies. Mm-hmm. And in almost every biography you read, the person who it's about talks about making sure they found time always for themselves, whether it was to think, whether it was to just meditate, whatever it was, but something to just, you know, I guess I'm I'm listening to that audio book now, Think Like a Monk, Mm -hmm. which is great. And and he talks about the monkey brain and the monk brain. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and how we just we, we go crazy sometimes and trying to shut that brain down to give ourselves some time is such a challenge. And, and I'm not sure why do we get ourselves into that state? You know, like, what, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you what do you think? Vernon? Why, why do we we do that? And even while we're doing it, we're saying to ourselves, right. No, I, I shouldn't be like this. <laughs> right? You know, I'm going to take an initiative with this. It's, you know, when we're talking about the instinctual brain, we got to, you know, appreciate it, I think is one of the big things. First, like we need that brain, right? 
it alerts us to danger, it alerts us to a threat. And a lot of the why it's like driving us to go, 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 because it's saying we need to survive, right? Now, a little bit of that is good, but what happens many times, and myself included, I have to hit the brakes many times, yeah. is when those instincts are starting to dominate. Now, what can happen, especially when we start getting ourselves worn out, we start using that almost to, to, to self-deprecate, right? Like, oh, I know this, I'm so stupid, I should know better. Um, why can't I do this? I know better. And for me, that's like, that's, that's like throwing paint on a wall. It's, it's, I mean, if you want to, I mean, or nail and yellow to a tree, great, try it, have fun. For me, it's like, you know, I really do appreciate you know, that I care about this, but I need this time to recover. And, but those instincts are powerful. They're strong. You will not outbeat the out, um, work them. And that's why I don't try to. For me, it's the questions. You know, how much space do you have for yourself? What would happen if you had more space? What does more space look like for you? And these are the questions I even say to myself. And even some of the strategies, you know, always suggest people use to create that space. Put a permanent calendar, invitation meeting on your calendar to think. I think every single week. I take two hours and I think. I don't worry. I don't stress. I think. But we need those instincts to keep us alive. But when they start dominating, it's we gotta we got we gotta do the dance versus that push that it can do to us. I mean, they're great things. It's just in copious amounts, it can be detrimental. Yeah. Okay. So I so I need to ask a question about this. So you have a time blocked in your calendar for two hours a week, where just for you to think, not for you to do anything, plan anything. Okay. So. So yes, how does that how does that look? I can't even imagine what that looks like. So how does the, how would that show up? Like you would please share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a question I, a lot of my clients ask. Ask. So with thinking, you know, we're, I think first we're entrepreneurs. We got in business because we thought we could be successful in it, right? So if a if a thought led you to get into action, why not take more time to think and figure out what other actions you can get into more strategically? That's why I'm big on I like strategic action. If I can do so, if I can sit back and you know the two hours might show up in thirty minute blocks, it might show up in an hour block, you know, with everything that's going on, well, you know, doing this chaos kind of going on like we were talking about earlier. Um, I've had to adjust my schedule a little bit. So now I get up at 4.30 just so I can make sure I get that in just because my son's asleep. Thank God uh, my son's asleep and I can focus, right? But you got to be flexible. But what you do in that time is, you know, this morning I got up at 3.30. I'm just going to sleep. And I literally just, I would, I'm not allowed to worry. And this takes practice. I make sure I want to say this. But I have topics that I'll, I'll think about, you know, the day before, the night before, or, you know, kind of like maxims. I might say something like, am I really working smarter or harder? Where are the gaps here? And I'll say, if I only had, if I could only do this in three steps, what would I do? Or then I'll just have these things. And I literally would look at something. And today was figuring out, am I being strategic as possible with how I'm kind of like partnering? And I just sat back and I'm like, who do I know? And with I have a, some problem or something I'm working through, and I just kind of have it as a theme. And a big thing for me is like, who do I know that can, um, who's seen this problem before that I can reach out to? I mean, darn if I didn't come up within a 10 minutes, literally. 10 minutes, something got solved. But had I just kind of went with it and got up and went to the gym or exercise and just kind of went to my role, I, the other 20 minutes I did come up with some other ideas. I'm like, oh, this could be something to think about. This could be something to think about. But those 10 minutes saved me so far two thousand dollars today but it was 10 minutes but you, you just have them themed and you keep them there I make everybody have thinking time you have to have thinking time in some cases depending on how busy clients are we will get on a call and i'll say all right i'm gonna step away you take this time to think and i'll still be in the room and they and i'll come and sit back down i just you know kind of sit here patiently so they can think because if you tell me that you can't we're going to find a way that you can did that answer the question? Absolutely. It's quite a novel concept for me anyways. I'm not sure about anyone else in our audience. I can't imagine. I mean, when I look at my calendar, there's no time blocked out for me. to. It's, it's My time in my calendar is for things that I have to do, not things that I have to think about. So I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to think about that one. Yeah. Uh, Use your time to think about that. Yeah. Just take 30 minutes. I always suggest start off small. You know, the, the, what's the fastest way to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Take one bite. See what it feels like. And then if you notice, and this is why I suggest things, but there's many ways you can do this. You know, once you start noticing, it's kind of like meditation, right? You know, to sit back in a room and maybe, you know, I'm just kind of going off 
a generality here, you know, with candles lit in essential oils and a mat, that's not meditation for a lot of people, right? You're like, hey, that doesn't work for me. You got to find a flavor that works best for you. You know, I meditate best when I'm lifting weights. I can zone out. I'm not thinking. I'm good. I come up with so many different ideas and so many different, just so many different things. But with the thinking time, if you notice that when you're having it that you have a hard time focusing, put on music. Or you notice you start thinking about some of your stresses or worries. What are some things that you could have surrounding you that make you happy? You know, I'll have someone in their practice of thinking time with me and they're like, well, I just can't focus. And I'll just ask them, look around my room. What do you see that makes you smile? And, you know, like typically my son's stuff is lying around. I'll have, I think it was called some fuzzy animal and I'll have Spider-Man stuff. And then they'll just start looking and they'll just start daydreaming and they won't even realize it. And they're not thinking about what's wrong. And then once I see in there in a particular place, I was just like, so how can we approach this smarter? Or I was like, who do you know who's seen this before? If you were thinking like James Bond, how would you solve this problem? You know, borrow someone else's brain. So to give them an idea of how they can create that. Yeah. Or how you can create that. Yeah. Interesting. Because I think that most people, you know, when they have a quiet moment to themselves, it really is filled with things that they worry about, Mm -hmm. not things that can move them forward. It's replaying what's going wrong and maybe even beating themselves up about it because they can't come up with a solution. So I love that approach. The the guitar, I am the worst guitar player you'll probably ever see in your life. I don't know that though. I will reach back and I will just sit back and just play the guitar and just think. Because if my hands are doing something, it's kind of hard to think about what's wrong, right? I'm just thinking. You just, nice little distractions to help you out. Yeah. I I mean, I think... as important as the thinking time is also what must come before the thinking time. And that is the discipline to block the time mm-hmm. and do the time yes. <laughs> for the thinking, right? That if you, because we, any, every single one of us can put time in our calendar, right? This is my, my thinking time, but then you re- need the discipline to say to yourself, okay, this is my time for thinking and that is all I am going to do. And I think that is something we all struggle with, right, is is discipline. We all want to do these things that we know are good for us. They know will help us. We know they will help improve maybe our lives. But still, you know, the discipline to actually do it and keep following through with it, it's tough. It really is tough. It is. You know, a lot of the things that, you know, I encourage clients to do, audiences to do, they're simple things, but they're not easy to implement. I do not take away from the fact that these things, they're they're not easy. They go out there and schedule things that make you happy. Take some thinking time. Sit back and make sure you're aligning yourself with strategic partners. Have a positive environment. It sounds like, oh, that's easy. Do it. (laughs) Go do it. And that's when, you know, having a coach, I'm like, so what did you accomplish this week? What got in the way? How are we going to do things differently? Yeah. If uh, you, what what problem could you solve in five minutes? All right, take care of that now. Go ahead. You know, it's there's simple things. A lot of you know, it goes back to you know having a you know, thinking of my son. It's everything that we needed to be successful in life. Practically everything we learned when we were kids, and we need reminders of it. And what has happened is we live in such a national, international society combined with so many different things going on. We've moved away from that, and now we just need to go back to almost the basic tenets of success and happiness. You know, you look at a kid. I mean, they take the time to get curious. They take the time to take naps. People undervalue naps. <laughs> By the way, your thinking time can be a nap because guess what? You get recharged with a nap, right? Yeah. You know, we, we forget about our nutrition. You kind of put that by the wayside. We forget that we need to have some sort of structure leaning back to with consistency. Consistency into discipline. And we, we forget that using kind language to ourselves. A kid doesn't call themselves stupid for falling. What does a kid do? Gets up. He yeah. gets what he wants. He or she wants, right? We, yeah. we forget these things. Yeah. No, it's, uh, that's so true. So true. Absolutely. That brings us, I think, is that, is that a, a good segue, Juliet? do you think? To Yeah, I guess, I guess with, we, we could probably sit here and talk to you for, for hours, and I'm sure that our audience could as well. So before you get into this brings us to the next part of our podcast, I would love for Vernon, if you could share, I know that you are teaching a class uh, Mm -hmm. called Own Your Happiness. If you could talk a little bit about that so that 
our audience, you know, could participate if they wanted to, and maybe it would help move them along their journey. Yeah, and, and thank you both for giving me, you know, a chance to talk about this. You know, back in, gosh, February, when we're all trying to make sense of everything that was going on, January, February, around that time, you know, depending on where you're located geographically, you know, I was looking, I'm like, what is happening, you know? And, and I sat back and I never thought I was a teacher, but I read this book uh, years ago. <laughs> it was called, What Color Is Your Parachute? And it said that I am a teacher. And I said, you are foolish, right? I was like, this book is made <laughs> ridiculous. And um, that's always about stuff with me. But what happened was in March, I said, let me do this. And I did an Own Your Happiness class. And it's a six-week class where we talk about happiness. We talk about boundaries. We talk about execution. You know, I think many people are, they, they have the map. They have the treasure map. They have it. They just don't, they're not digging. They are not digging. And I think what gets in the way is they know they need to dig, but they're not quite sure. Well, do I use a pickaxe? Do I use a shovel? But I talk about execution. I think I mentioned talk about boundaries. I, I talk about, you know, what we can do with what we have. And, you know, it's a fun class. Um, and it, it's just about getting people more results. I've had some, true, the class is always full. And, you know, at one point it was, oh, I'll just do 15. And 15 got full quick. I mean, it didn't even fill out in the day. And I'm like, this is weird. And then I started doing 20. I'm like, okay, this is weird. I'm like, then I kept going like, okay, this is getting weirder, but it, it's, it, it's a fun approach. And that's what people aren't talking about enough. It's fun. You, it's because with life, entrepreneurship, and even people who aren't entrepreneurs, you know, you got to remember like problems don't go away. They don't. You make a whole lot of money. That's going to be a whole lot of other problems you got to think about, you know, like, because then you're like, who can you trust? And when you start making more money, all of a sudden your phone starts ringing a little bit more. Like, oh, hey, how you doing? I got a bill, you know? I was wondering if you could help me out. But you got to look at it as, you know, I look at it and I make things fun because it's, a, it's like a, putting a puzzle together. No, you intentionally buy a puzzle. I mean, I think of this because me and my son are putting together a puzzle, a 500 piece puzzle. You know, it's going to frustrate you. You know, you're going to think that they didn't put that one piece in there that you need, but you bought it, right? Because you're going to have fun with it. And when you approach things like that, like it's a puzzle, it starts like all of a sudden the weight of it starts becoming lighter. But that's what the own your happiness is about. It's about teaching you how to dance with life. Mm. Very good. Excellent. We will make sure that in the show notes, we have all of your contact information so that yeah. anyone who is interested in uh, signing up and everybody wants to be happy. So oh, yeah. you should sign up for that program. And we could all definitely use some fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We all need it. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Especially right now. No, that is absolutely true. Well, that does bring us to that part of the show, Juliet. Thank you. And that is what we call the smart man, smarter woman version of James Lipton's Actors Studio, where we have six questions that we ask every guest the same six questions. And so if you're ready, are you ready, Vernon? We'll get oh, yeah. started. I love the question. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Question number one. What one word best defines an entrepreneur? The first word that came to my mind was creative. I would, the second word, no, unrealistic. Okay. Interesting. Okay. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? God, of course, I thought I had an answer. You know, a detective. What profession would you like never to attempt? Retail manager. <laughs> no hesitation there. No. <laughs> uh, what sound or noise do you love? The laughter that my son makes. What book would you recommend every entrepreneur should read? The Alchemist. Good choice. When your own entrepreneurial journey is complete, what do you hope your legacy is? Do it. Just do it. No one's going to believe you. No one's going to think it's possible. I started a happiness coaching practice. Do you know how foolish everyone thought I was? But my legacy will be do it. Perfect. Perfect. And for our listeners who would like to connect with you, what is the best way for them to be able to do that? 
You can find me on LinkedIn at forward slash what you're happy, Facebook forward slash what you're happy. Um, to get me the fastest is going to be to email me. And that's Vernon at what you're happy dot com. And it's happy with an I. And before you ask why an I, it's because you matter. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And all of that, your social links and your email, if that's okay with you, we'll put in the show notes. Absolutely. Please. And thank you. Perfect. And so before we conclude this episode, do you have any final thoughts, Vernon, you'd like to share with our audience? Yes. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this and uh, the first you know, phrase that comes to mind is something that I see often. It's not that people are in a bad place, but we're all working on some change right now, right? We're all working to maybe to refine a process, you know, refine ourselves. We're just, everyone's changing. And it's, I want everyone who's hearing this is we must work hard not to become our struggle especially right now where you, you, you cannot become your struggle. Whatever you're experiencing is what you're going through. It's not who you are. I know some people have had some significant and tragic things happening, you know, um, so let's be real. Cause I'm not going to sit back here and just say, you know, I can walk around with a smile and act like there aren't some people suffering, but you, you cannot become your struggle. Okay. We must work very hard not to do that. Yeah. That is great advice. Great advice. And what about you, Juliet? Actually just uh, to reinforcing the last statement. And I've heard this, a lot, you know, that the the time that you are in right now does not define who you are. Yes. And that it's, you know, it's not your last decision that is going to determine your path. It's your next decision. So I think that, oh. wow, I don't even know how to follow you two guys. That was uh, <laughs> great, great advice from, uh, from both of you. Well, I will, uh, this episode's words of wisdom are from Dennis Waitley. And he said, happiness cannot be traveled to, cannot be owned, cannot be earned, worn, or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a, was a pretty good quote for today. So in closing, thank you very much to our guest, Vernon. Great job. Really enjoyed the show. Likewise. Thank you to my awesome co-host, Juliet. You know, I can't do this without you. So thank you again. But most importantly, thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in and giving us a listen. We sincerely hope you found some value here today. And I'm pretty sure you did. If you did, please subscribe. You can find us in all the normal places, iTunes, Spotify, or visit the website, smartmansmarterwoman.com. So thank you again. Until next time, take good care of yourself and those that you love. Bye for now.